Welcome to Todd and Eve's show where I have conversations with folks and try to learn from them, learn from their mental models, learn publicly for everyone to listen to. And in this episode, we're continuing a long tradition of me interviewing my friends, which is always interesting to be able to ask people who you're close with questions that don't always come up in normal normal conversations. So in this episode, talking to Andy Nelson, who is a recording engineer and producer at Bricktop Recording. He's also a prolific and gifted songwriter, musician. Andy and I played together in Like Rats. He also has a band called Sour Mouth. He's been in tons and tons of bands. We'll link to some of his creative output in the show notes. So uh, worth going back in the archives there for some of that stuff as well. So Andy and I actually ended up having kind of a, a spacey discussion on songwriting today, right? I mean, just really digging into the the nuances and some some questionable quantum mechanics analogies about what songwriting feels like and how Andy thinks about actually crafting songs, both as um, himself for his own creative entities and in the context of helping other people write and record songs as he helps create albums for them. So pretty interesting stuff if you're into music, if you're into songwriting as, at all, and hopefully interesting as well, even if you're not. So check out this conversation with Andy Nelson. Andy, how many songs per month do you write? Um, it depends on the month. Because... Mean, uh, median, mode. <laughs> I, I used to know what those meant. <laughs> um, I would say during a busy time, uh, I might write... So, okay, and not complete songs usually, but at least like a verse and a chorus, like a verse riff, chorus riff, and and like a verse melody and a chorus melody, vocal melody. And on a on an active month, maybe 20, something like that. It's a lot. Yeah. What do, what do you do with them? Uh, they just are voice memos, just yeah. <laughs> hibernating in my phone. They just exist, the vaults. Yeah, and I... I don't often go back to them, which is, I, I feel it's like, um, I feel like I need to save them because I, I can't lose this idea. You know, this is like, this is pretty good. Um, and actually I remember, um, Tim Smith actually said something about this once where he said like, well, if the idea is like really good, you will just remember it or you'll remember it like long enough to actualize it. Um, which I think there's something too, because there are like little song ideas that I've had that have just been like percolating in my brain for, I don't know, 10 years or longer and like never have made the jump into reality. Um, but there's still a lot more that's just like, oh yeah, like I, could, I, I have periodically revisited and been like, oh, this is actually cool. I should do something with this. But Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I, I don't know if I buy that. I think that if, if you do remember something, it's probably good, right? If you have something that sticks yeah. with you, that yeah. probably means that it's good. But I don't think that that means that something that you don't remember easily isn't good, right? Yeah. It, it's like it's like there's a bunch of unremembered song ideas and riffs that probably were good and you just didn't remember them. Well, I think it also depends on, you know, I think with him, you know, I think he was just doing – one band with with drew at the time so he was just sort of like and that was his like i think sole creative outlet you know so he was just like writing riffs and then like he and drew would jam i, I could be wrong but i i know he wasn't you know he was like um he might have been working for google or something then but um but yeah but i think also if you have more stuff going on where it's like if i write a song it could be any number of things, you know, it's like, oh, this could be like a sour mouth idea. This could be a, like rat's riff. This could be, I mean, like right now I have probably, um, I might have a dozen song ideas that I've come up with in the last month and a half that are some new thing that actually Dan and I are going to get together on Monday and record one of them and we'll see how it goes. Um, so they're all like, different things and I, I have like a system for like you know what they're going to be or, or, or naming them in my voice memos so I can reference them but uh 
yeah, I don't know. It's it's hard. I think it would be hard to remember that many ideas. Yeah, <laughs> over, well, over so many different projects. So I mean, it, projects. And, and and that I mean that's that's a pretty insanely prolific amount of output, right? That that even people who are in bands that are releasing material all the time, and like you said, a lot of this stuff is just kind of like internal creation where you're like i just have this idea i'm gonna make it i'm gonna record it whatever and then it just you know like you said there's a there's just an archive of all of these ideas um you know that that's that's a lot of stuff that you're generating is that something that you have to force yourself to do where you're like okay it's time for my daily song to be written or is it just you you're just constantly generating these ideas it it if um i mean and 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 don't get me wrong. There are periods where it's like, I might not touch my guitar at home for like a month or more, like, and nothing's happening. You know, I'm, I'm busy with other things or it's just whatever, but usually there's, I don't know, there, there's always, there's just these like big arcs where something I hear, it's usually like triggered by like, I heard a new record or I revisited something or there was something that like kind of got me feeling inspired again. And, um, I don't know, it's just kind of like, you know, turning the tap on. Um, and I, it, it's kind of just like bubbling in my mind all the time. It, it sort of just feels like I, you know, uh, could get like Daniel Higgs about it. And I feel like I've, you know, I become like a conduit <laughs> for a moment and it's just sort of, um, stream of conscience. And I just kind of sit down and it, and it, comes out and I make a little demo and then I file that away and then I <laughs> do something else. And then maybe the next day, the same thing happens. Um, actually, I mean like for fun, I, I think I wrote a riff that sounded like it sounded like a killing joke riff. I wrote two riffs. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, that could be a verse and a chorus. If I, which era, uh, it was, it was, um, what's this for era. Um, so second LP, um, which I, that toggle, that and Nighttime and the first record kind of are always at odds for my favorite. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I was listening to that record a lot actually and other stuff. And I just like, oh yeah, that could be a, a killing joke riff. And then I was like, I thought for fun, oh, maybe just. Dan and I can like record a couple songs just to have them like not start a band, just do it. And then I just started like writing more and I was thinking about like, Oh yeah, like it would be sort of like this and this. And then suddenly I just had like 10 songs. Um, and you know, over the span of like a week or something and we recorded two and we never put vocals to them. It was almost just kind of like a fun experiment, but, um, yeah, it, it usually coincides with something in my listening habits or um, or just some inspirational thing, um, some source of inspiration. I mean, over the summer, again, it's always with it's always Dan because, you know, Dan is like the drummer I've played with probably the most and the longest. And um, I feel like I have the most like creative gelling with. Um, but at some point this over the summer, I was like, oh, I kind of want to start like a doom band or a, fu a funeral doom band in particular. And then just for like a couple weeks, I was consumed with that idea and writing riffs and writing parts. And again, I probably came out of it with like close to a dozen, like nearly their songs or song ideas. And we got together and we jammed a little bit, but it, nothing ever came of it. But it, it's sort of this cycle that always happens where uh, I just write all this stuff and it kind of just sits on the shelf. But in the moment, like that's enough for me. Like it's enough to kind of just write it and be satisfied that I've written something that I think is cool and, and would be really cool if it was properly realized as, as a recording with a, with a band. Um, but even just having, it's almost satisfying enough just to like feel that, that energy and that creativity and, you know, occupy my brain with it. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and also it's, it's 
astonishing just the the breadth of genres that you do this with right that you're like oh yeah i made i made all these killing joke sounding songs right and for those who aren't familiar um i mean killing joke sort of defies easy categorization but kind of like a post-punk slash new wave slash all kinds of other yeah, stuff proto-industrial right yeah yeah um you know and then funeral doom right very slow heavy metal um yeah you know i mean the the stuff you do with sour mouth is much more early 90s alt rock yeah right i mean it's in, it's all over the place and i imagine that just based upon hearing you say hey i write whatever 20 songs a month um that you're you're just kind of like tagging different genres and just channeling all this creativity into all kinds of different stuff is that accurate yeah pretty much i think um it i i listen to a lot of stuff and i i want to do a lot of stuff um i don't have the time or energy to really realize a lot of it um and i i, I hate and love writing lyrics the, i wish i could turn on the lyric writing faucet mm -hmm. like i can the the riff writing faucet but you know some of that you know depending on who i'm with i could just outsource it to that um to that to to whoever else be like write some lyrics for me i, I have melodies <laughs> <laughs> um but uh yeah i don't know uh maybe i need to just like you know get in one of those like songwriting houses or something and uh and just do that <laughs> Just write write songs or licks for other people. Write jingles. Yeah, right. I mean, that that a lot of musicians, I think, really struggle with the creative aspect, right? That people get sort of like writer's block with actually creating their music. You know, that they they just feel stuck and like none of their ideas are good, and that they can't tap into that ability to to sort of like you said, just channel stuff, right? That I think that anyone who's written stuff that they're proud of for any period of time has had that moment where just like some fully formed idea just kind of appears in your brain and you're like, oh, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> Thanks for that one. Like we'll go ahead and yeah, try yeah. To figure out what's going on there. Right. That, that you seem to, have to be able to just access that consistently in a way that I imagine most songwriters are envious of. I mean, yeah, I, it depends though. Cause it's, I still feel like, I mean, the last I mean, like, I, I, I probably contributed, like, a riff idea or two to the Rats LP, the last LP we put out. But beyond that, the last piece of music that I even released was the Sour Mouth EP, which came out, what, like, two or three years ago, ago now or something like that. So uh, there's there's a lot that doesn't materialize i mean it's there or or the vast majority of it is our, our kernels and they're there but you know it's just tough to I, to pull the trigger to make it real you know i feel like i'll i'll like be like okay i'm gonna record this and then suddenly the impulse it it, it fizzles a little bit or or around the time where i feel like i'm ready to to start recording it or making it real it the the motivation uh, kind of starts to dissipate a little bit, um, which I I don't know what that's about. It sucks because it's just like, well, I have like access to a full like studio with incredible gear and like a great drum room and all this and that. But then it's just like, I literally could just come here every day and record song after song after song. But I, it's 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 hard to do that for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and, and I, I think I experienced this with a lot with a lot of things too, where the idea generation phase is the fun and enjoyable part. Yes. Right. Like it's easy to make an outline in a first draft of like an article that I want to write. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's easy. Well, I don't know about easy. I mean, it sounds like it's much easier for you, but I enjoy coming up with you know two or three riffs that go together. Right? Yeah. It, oh yeah. It, that oh, I could do that, that all day. Yeah. yeah. Right. And yeah. then, and then there's another part, which is like the sort of editing and coalescing part, which is painful, right? Yes. That's an unpleasant process. Like I don't want to read my bad writing <laughs> and turn it into something that is cohesive and makes sense and doesn't have like 
clunky run on sentences. Right? right. I don't want, you know what I, I do actually enjoy in songwriting the, the big picture structuring hmm. of like, Oh, this is going to be a cool way to take this riff and turn it into something else. And then like, I have a cool idea for how to reprise it later, hmm. but the, the deep, like the, the very zoomed out and the very zoomed in, I find pleasurable, but the yeah. kind of like, let's make this actually make sense and clean up all the things that are minorly wrong. The with work it is not the work part. <laughs> yeah. That, that part is the part that isn't fun. I think. Yeah. 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 No, I, 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 I 100% sympathize with that. That's, that's more or less what it's like, I think for me too. And yeah, you know, cause it's like, okay, cool. I got a verse and a chorus. Like I gotta write a fucking bridge now. Like, what am I going to do? Like, Oh, it's going to be the chorus riff, but now there's a solo over it or something, which is what yeah. Sour Mouth did all the time. It was great, sure. but it's just like, well, how, how, how many times can you do that? Uh, and it's hard to break out of, at least for I mean, most of the stuff that I'm doing. Well, I guess the funeral, the funeral doom songs I were writing, that was a little bit more nonlinear or a little bit more um, linear, but um, you know, like a lot of the, I mean, even like the, the, you know, I was writing the killing joke sounding songs like they still more or less uh have like a kind of pop structure i mean because they that band does i mean it's like it's very like droning you know especially that, that second lp where it's just like cool this is like one riff for five minutes and like the vocals change or the drum melody changes or there's like a synth line that comes in or maybe there's like one little there's like a like the, the riff changes you know a few times, you know, but it, it's, it's one or two riffs and it just drones. And it's so hard to like take something simple like that, where it's just like, okay, cool. Like I have two riffs. I, that's all I need. But then, yeah, the editing part, which is like, well, how does that, how do you make that last for more than 45 seconds? And it's interesting. Uh, and that's, you know, again, that's part of that editing work that that's, difficult to yeah difficult to, to make it into a real thing <laughs> yeah that 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 a lot of that stuff doesn't have the inherently pleasurable aspect of a lot of the other pieces so it's there there's just a different type of mental energy that's required right it's like a yeah. certain amount of focus and discipline to do something that isn't necessarily fun um and also a certain amount of creativity required to like connect these pieces in a way that makes sense. So it's, it's, yeah. it's an interesting in between space of creative energy that isn't just the like expansive possibilities and coming up with ideas, nor is it just like, I don't know, a rigid sort of like, Oh, I made this Excel spreadsheet and it needs to be cleaned up because there's too many different columns and stuff. So I just need to like be disciplined and delete the stuff that doesn't belong and have it make sense. It's, it's neither of those it's in between and in a pretty difficult spot. Yeah. I mean, the that's other, what it feels like to me. Yeah. Well, and the other aspect of it is just like the logistics of like, okay, like I have some riffs, you know, I want to jam them in person and see how it feels. So I'm going to like hit up Dan or whomever to, to meet up at the space. And it's like, okay, we have to like, coordinate our schedules and you know everyone's got work and like okay this is you know oh this is when i normally eat dinner you know like what am i going to do for that and you know all of it is is further uh encumbered by just being a basically an adult i feel like i can say now that i'm 37 yeah. um but where it's like yeah you know it's like oh, okay you can you can you can jam it together i can sing some gibberish see what feels right and you know, that can work. Um, but it's hard to do that. You know, I mean, the practice space is so close to where I live, but it's still just like, yeah, but we got to get there and we got to like settle in for a little bit. And then, you know, hearing your, hearing your interview with, um, with Preston from a feather and bone where it's just like, oh yeah, they just get together and practice for like six or seven hours. And it's just like, man, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I don't, I don't, <laughs> how do you, I mean, there's only three guys in the band that, that helps, I'm sure. But like, it was, it was hard to get just like you, me and Drew together sometimes to practice for a couple hours once right. a week, you yeah. know? So yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, well, it, it, it's sort of just like the, the transaction cost and the opportunity cost of doing anything is so high, right? Yeah. Where even, even though it's seemingly not that big of a deal to just like go to band practice or whatever, that if you're in a major urban environment, it's like, oh, I have to like drive there and there's probably going to be traffic and, you know, maybe I have to figure out how to park or something like that. Yeah. And it's just, like, there's just a lot of like minor hassles. And then, you know, especially, um, with people who are self-employed or, um, you know, involved in, in just whatever, running a variety of different projects, anytime you're doing something is a time that you're not doing something else. Right. So it's like, right. yeah, it sounds good to go to band practice or it sounds good to practice my guitar. Or it sounds good to write something or whatever. Right. And anytime you're doing that, that means like, I'm not responding to the 39 emails that I have. I'm not doing the 15 administrative tasks that are undone. I'm not moving this project forward. That's, you know, behind uh behind schedule right that there's right. always an opportunity cost that so if you if you combine like a, a a high transaction cost with a high opportunity cost it's just really hard to do stuff oh yeah i mean and even and this is i think about this all the time when you know especially lately i've been thinking about like oh like you know we we haven't really played a lot of shows you know like rats and and i think a lot some of that is by design we're being choosier about playing just because like we have these like, you know, dense professional lives. Um, but then, but yeah, it's tough though. Cause it's just like, cool. It, yeah. It would be great to like go play a show um, on a Saturday, but weekends are primarily when I have sessions and I'm working. So it's like, and, and if we play a show that pretty much means like that has to be my day, you know? Um, so it's like, okay, cool. I, I'm, you know, it's not just like, oh, I'm taking a day off. No, it's literally like, like, no, I'm like negative now the amount of money I would have made that day working. Because it's not, like, I don't take a salary. I just, like, go project by project. So it's like, oh, like, going on tour for, like, a week or something. It's like, that's not, like, a paid vacation. That's just literally, like, now I'm spending all this money to do this thing and losing money. Because I'm not worried. It's like literally a double negative to like do these things. And that's, you know, it's not a helpful way to think about it, I'm sure. But like, it's the reality. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, all this shit just kind of like clashes together. And it's, it's all of it makes for a lot of like great uh, fantasizing about like <laughs> what I could do, you know, with all these songs. Uh but yeah, then ultimately it's just kind of like, cool. I have like 300 voice memos in my phone of song ideas. Um, but part of it is, is you know, I'm, I, like I said, I'm getting together with Dan um, a couple days from now because I was finally like, I'm, I just need to fucking do this. Just fucking do it. Call, like text him, get together, just do it. See how it goes, you know, and... And we'll see if something comes with it from it. Um, and if not, whatever, no big deal. So, I'm, I, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I am curious since, I mean, you, you know, you, you've touched on your work as a, as a producer and a recording engineer, you know, that this is something that a lot of bands probably experience and struggle with is actually completing the creative process. Right. And especially listening to a variety of interviews with, with artists, et cetera, you find out that, you know, a lot of records that they put out that are bad are bad because they essentially went into the studio with really nothing and yeah. then kind of had to throw something together and yeah. then it just ends up sucking. And it's like, oh, their first two records were good because they were just at band practice all the time, right. writing stuff and finishing it. And then they became a big enough band that they were on tour all the time and started moving into different cities. So they're not getting together to work on stuff. And then they just like show up to the studio with nothing and make a, make a bad album. So, yeah. you yeah. know, for, for you in your sort of professional life, quote unquote, right being the facilitator of bands actually recording something and finishing that creative process, how do you see bands solving that problem? Do, do they have an effective way of, of completing it? Is there someone in the band who's the idea generator and then someone else is like, okay, like we have to make this a song. Like, what, what, what does that look like? Um, it depends. I've only, I haven't worked with too many bands who are in those kinds of situations. Um, 
you know, I, I the the majority of bands I work with are 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 not on labels, and they're not, um, you know, super well established to the degree where they would continue the band despite all living in like, you know, all over the place. Um, I did have um, a band, uh, Wrist Meat Razor, in over the summer, and. It is. It is a little bit hodgepodge. Like I, I, I'm not exactly sure about how they go about their writing process, but I know all their demos were done with like programmed drums, and they got together and recorded um, demos. And um, Isaac from Knocked Loose um, uh, helped them in the pre-production, produced the record, and I mean he was like programming the drums and. Um, so yeah, it was kind of just like a scaled back version of that. And then um, the singer Justin would, would write lyrics to it. I, I guess I can't really speak to how exactly their creative process works, but they were able to basically come together virtually at the very least to to make it all real. And then, um, uh, yeah, I think, and, and the drummer just like was learning the songs based on the program drums and bringing some of their own ideas into it. Uh, so yeah, it's, I will say that I, I, I'm kind of annoyed when bands show up and don't have all of their stuff figured out. Um, was not the case with Risk Meat Razor. They were, they were great, but I have had many bands where, I mean, nobody has any of their, all their fucking lyrics written. That's like always a thing. Um, cause it's tough. Cause it's, it's tough to write lyrics to a crappy iPhone demo or whatever, or just like a solo guitar riffing or, you know, um, uh, and, and normally that wouldn't be such a big deal, but it's like so many of these bands, it's like, okay, we have like three days to record these six songs or something, which is fine. Like that's totally fine for me if everybody knows their parts and like is well rehearsed. So most of my job in that scenario is just like keeping things moving, you know, and sort of like, yeah, like obviously I want you to play the best you can and I want us to get the best sounds we can. But at some level it's like, we got to keep moving because we have this amount of time and you know, if they're from Chicago, okay, you know, sometimes it's a, there's an agreement where it's like, if we run out of time, no big deal, we'll, we'll schedule more. But a lot of times it's a band from out of town and it's like, okay, at the end of this, like, we're done. Unless you want to, like, drive halfway across the country again to, like, finish the last few songs of vocals. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I truthfully don't know how those bands, the really, like, spread out groups deal with it. Um, um, I did work with a, with a death metal band, um, called Polyptic some years ago. Um, really super technical, like, um, kind of proggy at times, um, death metal. They're great. And they write all of their songs via, I think it's called, it's like Guitar Pro, I think, is the program. Is it the thing where you can sort of make tabs that turn into musical notation? Yes. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. So they, they like have a shared folder on like Dropbox or something. And they're just, you know, all contributing and like editing these Guitar Pro arrangements with drums and everything. And they like, they might never all be in the same room playing together. But then when they show up, they kill it. Like the drummer... Um, this guy, Troy, he's literally rehearsing to a click track and like MIDI guitar notes. Yeah. <laughs> like, and it sounds insane. Like, yeah. And they'll be in real time. They're all great musicians too. So they can like, in, you know, they have their laptop open here and like, oh, actually, you know, let's, it, let's do it like this. And they'll like, tip, 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 like edit some notes and they'll be like, okay, cool. And then they can just execute it. Um, so I think I've been fortunate to for the bands that are spread out like that or not being together, you know, sometimes they can make it work because I mean they're all like freak players and pretty devoted to what they're doing and and yeah, they do they do collaborate, you know. So um yeah, I don't know. I I I truthfully don't know what it's like to have a band show up and just be like 
yeah, we have like some ideas, uh, like, you know, and then they're just kind of jamming it. Like, I mean, that's happened like, I can recall a time where a band did a bunch of songs and then, you know, at the end of the session, they were working on one and they kept like sort of having these false starts. We were tracking the drums and, and the one guitar player live together and they kept having these weird false starts and stopping and I would hear them talking and, I'm, and I was just like, I was like, wait, are you guys like writing this song right now? And they're like, well, yeah. And I was just like, we have two days to do a full length <laughs> like, I'm sorry, guys. Like, in, unless you guys nail it in the next like five minutes, like we need to move on. And and sometimes I feel bad when I have to like bring the hammer down like that because I try to be pretty like flexible and open. But yeah, as I recall, we did finish like just in time. I mean, it was like a grind band, so it was it wasn't like you know it, it like an ultra precise you know uh, metal band or you know an ultra like you know there were no clean vocals that need to be perfectly, you know, in key or whatever. So we could be a little bit fast and loose, but even still, it was just like, uh, if you guys wanted to book like another day, yeah, you guys could like fuck around and like finish writing this song. But if you actually want to like leave here done, we need to move on. Like, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious as well about, you know, your role as a producer versus as an engineer, right? Because, I mean, I think that um, the the lines between those aren't always clear. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just actually don't know how much bands are relying on you when they come in to, you know, help them with the songwriting process and to, to give creative input versus how much they're relying on you to, you know, make it sound good and, and kind of keep them disciplined. Like you were saying to stay, um, you know, on budget and on time. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what, what, what does that look like for you? And actually before, 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 um, we talk about that, it might be useful to explain the distinction between, uh, producing and engineering as well for folks. So, um, it is super blurred now and it has been for, you know, I don't know, many years at this point, but traditionally the producer was the one who would, well, actually even going further back, the role was even more different than that. I guess the engineer was sort of, is sort of like the nuts and bolts engineer, like, okay. Uh, the producer sort of like delegates, to the engineer, like, I want this sort of sound or I want this sort of thing. The engineer is the one who knows how to, like, set up the mics and, like, run the equipment, run the the tape machine or the Pro Tools session, and is kind of just executing all of the mechanical aspects of the recording. Um, so, um, yeah, basically just that. And then the producer is sort of like the big picture person who would be working with doing pre-production with the band. So um, kind of like going through their songs and either editing them or editing the arrangements or contributing song ideas, um, uh, contributing lyrics or editing lyrics. Um, In some instances, the producer is the one who's kind of responsible for generating like a vibe in the studio. I mean, there's guys like Ross Robinson who did like the first Corn records and a bunch of like new metal stuff. Who's like really into dialing up the emotional state of the performers so that they they play a certain way. So um, I guess yeah, the, the 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 producer is sort of more big picture, facilitating the um, the emotional impact of the material and the engineer is facilitating all the kind of mechanical stuff. Um, um, and some, and actually in a lot of modern pop scenarios, like the producer is the one who's does like all the songwriting. So like, you know, you have these cats in LA who just like write songs and then we'll find a singer. Um, they might, the singer might write the lyrics or the producer might write the lyrics. Um, but then they go into a studio and they were with an engineer who will, put up the mic for the singer, be responsible for um, doing edits on the fly, or they say, okay, we like this vocal, this take from this vocal track, we like this take from, or or this vocal from this take, this vocal from this take, and the engineer is kind of cobbling all together like a a, a comp 
of that. Um, so yeah, um, more and more though, and particularly with um, a lot of like rock and metal stuff, the producer kind of and engineer lines are more blurred. So um, yeah, like the 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 producer might make suggestions to the arrangements or work on pre-production with the band where they're going through the songs and working on vocal melodies or lyrics. And then when they go in the studio, that same person might be setting up mics and dialing in amplifiers. They might have an assistant who's like running the Pro Tools session or like will run out in the room to like move something. Um, but they might still be doing kind of the lion's share um you know, almost sort of like producing the engineering side of it, if that makes sense. Um, it, it, as far as what I do, it's rare that I'm deeply involved in the songwriting aspect of it. Um, in fact, I can count on one hand the amount of times where bands were specifically asked me to like produce, produce. Like, you know, we want to like, you know, here's our demos. Like, what do you think? Do you have any ideas? Um most recently, um, the Chicago band Lurk, um, I actually produced their their um, upcoming LP. Um, and by upcoming, I mean like I think fall of 2021. And it's supposed to come out of it's supposed to come out like the end of summer of 2020 or fall 2020. So that sucks, but it is a great record. Um, so yeah, that was an instance where they would send me demos. I would, I made a lot of notes about like where to push it in the studio in terms of tones. Um, but there were a few songs where I suggested like, okay, this one, this hook is like too strong to just play the chorus twice. Like let's do three choruses and come up with something for a bridge. And there was another song where they had a demo with vocals that they recorded. And I like, wrote a vocal harmony and recorded my vocal harmony over their demo and sent it back to them to see what they would say. Um, I wasn't super, I mean, there wasn't like a ton of um, songwriting pre-production stuff that I, that I messed with because I think I thought the songs were pretty fucking great just as is. But, um, but then in the studio, I, I was pretty hands on with like, tones you know like okay like let's try this amp for this part we need something that sounds like this and with the drums you know we had a couple different drum setups different kick drums different snares um and uh yeah and and but that level of production sort of having like um a little bit of of influence or control over the tonal aspects that's not that unusual for me and i think that's what most people are looking for when they want me to do their record is they don't want me necessarily to like take their songs apart or suggest like riffs or lyrics but they do want like help with their guitar tone or like they want to use like our drums here and like you know want my opinion on like tuning them or whatever i mean i'm I'm pretty, I have strong opinions about drum tuning in general. So I'm, I'm usually, I'm usually sticking my, my, my nose into that regardless. But, um, but yeah, uh, uh, I, uh, yeah, that's, that's much more common where bands have their songs. They, they know what they want, but then they'll ask me to help them get to that sonically. So it's not necessarily like, you have to, use, this has to be my guitar amp that I brought from home. That's what we're using. It's more like, I oh, yeah, this sounds cool. More, more often than not, they're like, do whatever you want. Like, honestly, like, I like this amp, but if you have something that's cool, like, let's do it. And it's like, okay, yeah. And I usually pull out a few, we do a shootout, and I try to, like, see what they think. And the best scenario is that I can kind of, like, meld with what they want. And... I can bring my ear to the table in my experience, but ideally I'm, I'm just sort of like, um, yeah, just like kind of like forming a, a, a symbio symbiotic relationship with 
with them and their vision for the band. Sure. No, that, that makes sense with, with tone especially, right? Because, I mean, um, sort of like you said, a lot of folks are looking for a producer or a recording engineer to help them with that aspect of things. Because there is the element as well of the way that you like something to sound when you're in your practice space playing it. Right. You know, if you just go into the studio and just use the same amp with the same settings, it doesn't sound that way when it's recorded, right? So it's like yeah. you need you potentially need someone who's like, okay, I see what you're trying to do here. Let's figure out a way to make this sound the way that you think it should sound yeah. based upon you using like your crappy combo amp in your practice space. Yeah. Like we're going to turn this into something, you know, that's right. going to actually sound good on record. So, I mean, th there's like an element of translation there, but, but I'm actually really curious about this, this concept of, you know, producing songs themselves, right? facilitating song structures, coming up with harmonies, you know, being like, ah, that part doesn't work so well. Cause it actually sounds like that's something that, um, is easy for you. Well, I don't know about easy, but, but works well for you when you're editing someone else's work or contributing to someone else's work, but is challenging for you to do to your own work based upon our previous discussion. Oh is yeah. That I, I think about that a lot actually. And I think really what it comes down to is I work very well with a prompt. Like, if it's something, if it's, if it's conjured from nothing, uh, that's way harder. And I think a lot of it is sort of just like, um, option paralysis where it's like, okay, like there's a song already there or, or a kernel of one that someone else has come up with, you know? So I, I don't even have any creative investment yet. And so being able to look at it from the outside and there's already like, you know, a bed of material there that that is easier to work with because I mean, I don't know the, the, the net like it creative energy spent is probably the same, you know, it's like, okay, I wrote like a verse and a chorus and I got, got a couple of like, harmonies and, and maybe a, mel or a melody and a couple harmony ideas. And then versus like, okay, somebody else has like written basically a song. And then if they want me to kind of like uh, put my spin on it, or if they want my opinion on it, you know, I can, that same amount of creative energy will go, <laughs> could go into, oh, well, let's like do this part shorter or do this longer, or here's this vocal melody, or what do you think about like, um, a synth in this part or something? Um, maybe. Um, but I, I think in general, just having like a prompt is really important for me. Um, and that's also why, I think I benefit from playing with other people where I can, you know, I could, like I said, I can write a riff, write a couple of riffs and string them together for days, but having, being able to play with somebody in real time and see how it works, that in itself almost becomes like a prompt because they're going to do something different than I envisioned. And that might be a jumping off, jumping off point for something else. Um, I, I think it's similar for, you know, producing work. It's just sort of like, and it helps if I'm really excited about it. I mean, like the band, yeah. a band like Lurk, especially who I really like genuinely like, like I would, I would listen to them if I hadn't recorded any of their releases. Um, so I, when I, when I heard the demos and I was like, you know, really excited. Like, I love this. Like, this is, this doesn't even have vocals on it. And this is great, you know? So my mind starts turning with like what we could do with it in the studio, or I hear vocals and my mind starts turning with like vocal effects or harmonies. Um, so in a, in a way it's almost as similar as like, like, damn, I really love this killing joke record. I wonder if I could write some riffs that song sound like that, you know? And it's just like, Oh, okay. Like, I really love this, these lurk demos. Like, I wonder, like, you know, it's, it's like, it feels like it's turning on the same creative faucet to like, um, kind of join in with them in, in their creative process and, and push things, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm imagining an analogy with writing, which is something that I have more experience with as far as like editing other people's work and having my work edited. Right. Cause I think with writing, you can get in a similar sort of, I don't know if funk is the right word, but we'll say funk where you write something 
and trying to edit it is very painful, yeah. right? That you have sentences that you know are clunky that you just can't quite figure out how to rephrase properly. Yeah. And you, know, and you, you have sections that you think should maybe be deleted or moved, but you're not really sure what should happen with it. And you can sort of feel that something's wrong. And like we were talking about earlier, there's a lot of friction to actually fixing it. Um, but potentially editing someone else's work, you know, that just being zoomed out a little bit, it's much easier to just be like, okay, this sentence is a disaster. Here's a suggested rewrite. Yeah. You know, like this section, I understand why you included it, but this is kind of extraneous information and it just sort of distracts from your main point. So just delete it. You know, yeah. you're, you're, you're not, you're not sort of like wrapped up in the process as much. So it's easier to, to edit like that. And I do think that something that that's potentially very valuable from a producer coming in and offering suggestions like that, similar to someone editing your work is that, Getting feedback from people on creative stuff is very valuable, but a lot of the time their feedback is inaccurate, right? That a lot of people will read something and they'll maybe make suggested edits or add comments and you're like, you're completely wrong, yeah. but the fact that you're picking this part out as a part that needs help is valuable to me. Right? Sure. I don't agree with your rewrite. I don't agree with your suggestion of what it should say instead, but... The fact that you pointed this out, like, yeah, something needs to change here, right? But there are a select few people who can actually make a rewrite that is better. Yeah. That can actually improve your argument by making a suggestion. And that that's like an exceptionally valuable skill. And I imagine there's probably something similar with songwriting, right? Where you, you may get feedback from someone where they're like, oh, that part, like is kind of boring or whatever. And they may make a suggestion that's bad, but if someone is actually like, Oh, okay. Well, what we need to do is chop this part in half, add a transition here, and then, you know, double this part. And they're actually right that that's, you know, that's just so valuable to be able to not just pinpoint the problem, but to actually offer a suggestion that improves it. Yeah. Well, and so it, a lot of times it, it can confirm what you already know, right? Where it's just like, mm, yeah. Okay. Like, you know, yeah, this part, I'm not super confident on it. And if somebody else hears it and are just like, yeah, I don't know. That part kind of feels like filler. It's like, well, okay, your, your suspicions are confirmed because like, yeah, if somebody from the outside heard it and like senses it in that way, you know, then, well, you're, you're out, the cat's out of the bag. Like you got to do something about it. Um, yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely something to that. And I think it, it helps to kind of foster, I mean, trust is the biggest thing. Um, obviously if somebody makes a suggestion, you know, uh, it, it's tough because you get precious about ideas, you know, even if you don't, you're not totally confident in it, it's still hard to like, let go. Um, I mean, there were times, okay. So my one and only time working with like a producer on my own music was when too sweet recorded with Mike Watts in long Island. And there were times where it was just like, man, I don't know. Like, he wants to do this. He wants to cut it like this much or like, and then like listening back, it was like, no, that was absolutely the right thing to do. You know, like there were so many things that was just like, yeah, first of all, like this, this is now, this flows better or it's more cohesive or it, it, this part doesn't drag or this is like a better vocal melody. You know, I listened to, we have demos of some of those songs where there's like three different iterations of like a chorus melody. And the one that we ended up with on the record is the one that Mike suggested. And that's the one. And that's like, yeah, that was the thing to do. Um, and so it was, it was hard to let go at some of those times, but ultimately, you know, his discography to that point, especially really spoke for itself. And it was like, okay, well, this is what we're paying him to do and let's just do it. And it worked out. I think it worked out pretty well. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, your, your point about getting precious with stuff is really interesting too, especially with something like a song where there's an element of familiarity that makes things seem correct to you. Yeah. Right. So it's really hard if you've written a song to be a certain way, not even because you're stubborn or being overly precious about it, but just because it just sounds wrong when it's different. And it can be very difficult for a creator to dissociate the fact that it sounds wrong to them because that's different than what they've been hearing mm -hmm. from whether or not it's a better idea. Yeah. So I guess I'm curious, you know, do, do you have any way of 
facilitating that for people or doing that in your own head as you try to come up with uh, potential ideas? I mean, I, I definitely don't want to, you know, and, and like I said, it, I can count on one hand the amount of times that I've been really like that involved in the production process or, or, or pre-production sure. songwriting process with a band. Um, but I mean, there's, there's numerous times where I suggested a, a harmony or maybe a riff or a tone or a, even a pedal or something, but I'm ultimately it's their record. And if they really don't want it, like, I'm not going to like force it. Like if, you know, like I don't. Sure. Yeah. The, the, the Albini school of, all right, we'll set it up for you. We'll make it happen. Um, I never want to, I never want to force it if, you know, they're not, uh, they're, they're just not having it, you know, because it's like, maybe if I feel like, you know, deep down, like I'm correct and this will be better if they still don't like it and they're going to listen to their song a year from now and be like, I really wish you would have done this our way. You know, I would, I would feel awful about that. So, um, yeah, I, I guess in terms of other bands music, haven't done it enough to really feel like I had to like swing my weight or like, um, really push for something that wasn't, wasn't wanted. I mean, like the guys in, in Lurk, for example, the most recent time I've done this, like they were extremely open. Like it was awesome. Like, I mean, we all know each other pretty well. So there's, there's pretty good comfort level there, but, um, yeah, they they were pretty much cool, um, but I also didn't really do anything that drastic. So, but with my own stuff, it yeah, uh, it's it's I've tried different techniques where you know sometimes you know the first melody that comes to my head for like a guitar part, it's like that's the one that's stuck there and I can't get it out. And I mean, there's there's I'll I'll periodically like remember a riff that I wrote like ten years ago. And I still hear like the melody in my head that I didn't think was that great and thought could be better. And it's still there. And it's like, what the fuck? Like I, this is, this got, there's something else like this, this chord progression is not like that unique. You know, there, there are a million different melodies that could be sung over this. Um, and it's hard to get away from that. Some of it is, is I try to do like a little bit of free association. Um, when I was doing Belonger, um, I would play demos in my car and I would just be like literally like singing gibberish over and over to the songs, trying to just like trick my brain into not hearing like the first thing that came to my mind and to, to, to try something else. And that worked actually a couple of times. Um, I, I don't know. I don't, I, it's, it's hard. It's hard to, to break away from that, to, to break away from your own. I mean, cause in that case, it's like yourself, you know, like yeah. <laughs> I, like I have to convince myself that this idea, which I know is not good, but now I have to like, not feel it as the thing that should be there anymore. Um, you know, which, I don't know. I feel like I'm getting heady with that, but it, it's, that's, it's a weird conflict to, experience and and ult and ultimately the the thing that i found is like you just got to move on like if if i'm if i'm like that early in a songwriting phase and i haven't really gotten that far with it like fucking put it away like write something else you know i'm i'm i think i've written stuff that has potential but i'm totally fine with just being like just start something else you know like it's <laughs> regardless none of it's probably going to get really recorded anyway it'll but, just be a voice memo yeah 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 if if you could if you could um if i had a camera on me right now i would scroll through my voice memos and <laughs> we would be, we would be here for a minute while I, until I got to the bottom um but you know it's still it, it's still something i need to do to to just feel like i'm making something i think that is kind of the impulse at the core of it all and doing this process of, of self editing and, and writing or whatever, you know, you know, like I said, if it doesn't go anywhere, that's fine, but it's still, 
important to me to be able to do it and to have these bursts periodically. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that the to, to kind of circle back to the idea of trying to get out of whatever a tractor loop a certain melody has over a, a specific progression or whatever, it, it's interesting to think about that in the context of improvisation, right? Where if you think of a lot of um, improvisational music, a lot of those folks do have patterns that they tend to go into or even within a specific solo or whatever, you know, they have a certain theme that they're playing off of, but that they've, they've developed the the skill to a high level of moving to something adjacent from their idea while still retaining the core of the idea, which then starts to open up new space for them to create something else. Right. And, and that, that's really interesting to think about. Like, is there a way to break out of those loops by, not necessarily trying to come up with something new, but by trying to alter the thing that exists and then open up a new possibility space and then potentially find like a new attractor for whatever the, the melody is. I, I actually have kind of an example, I think, of, of what you're talking about that I was successfully able to do. I had a Belonger song that one of the ones that actually got recorded um, and I was struggling forever with a with a verse melody. I think I had a chorus, but I didn't have a verse. And I was doing my thing where I was listening to it over and over and just singing gibberish in my car. And at some point I hit something and again, you know, I feel like Killing Joke is coming up a lot, but that's fine because they're they're actually just one of my favorite bands. But I hit, I, I, you know, nicked a melody and it was just like, oh, that kind of sounds like Killing Joke. Oh, what would Jazz Coleman do over this part and then immediately it was like i had an idea so it's almost at some level it 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 feels like i can sort of reference other artists or like you know sour mouth i've actually done this a few times where it's just like i need a melody here okay what would uh what would no gal what would what would noel gallagher do you know, and literally just try to like mentally do an impression of that person and just see what comes out. And thankfully it doesn't, I think, come out like exactly like, you know, just sounding like, oh, you're just ripping off Oasis now or you're, you're ripping off Killing Joke. But I think maybe, maybe that, that sort of feels like what you're talking about, where it's like you're shifting, there's a kernel there that, that feels adjacent to this other thing, this external piece of art that you can reference and for me at least it almost becomes like okay you just put on a mask for a little bit and pretend you're that person and see what comes out and even you know especially if that person or that band wasn't the source of that riff um um pushing it that way mentally can 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 yield a new result that doesn't sound like either of those things either your first idea or the thing that you're referencing um hopefully that makes sense uh, no totally i mean I, I think that especially for anyone who who is creative and does have their own style in any way you know that that part of being influenced by someone isn't necessarily just exactly ripping them off although that does happen it's that you have the idea and then that's filtered through your own whatever filter to create yeah. something that that becomes unique, yeah. right? And 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 sort of what you're saying there. I mean, you know, we we already got a little heady and spacey on some of this stuff, but I I almost think of it like uh um like collapsing a wave function, right? Where you have this sort of yeah pr- like probability uh probability space of where something can be, and then under certain circumstances, that probability collapses into a specific spot where the thing actually is. And that, you know, that, that, that songs have sort of wave functions and you can end up sort of like I was saying with it, with it collapsing into a specific area. And then part of the creative process is being able to, uh, potentially find a new attractor state, right. Or, or, or a new, a new way to collapse that wave function into something different. And that's sort of a, a, not, not, not a fantastic analogy in a few ways, but that, that's kind of the way that I'm thinking about it. Dude, I actually really like that analogy because Sometimes that is what my brain feels like when I'm trying to think of, you know, with it's always it's always with a vocal melody for for me I think. But yeah, it's like okay, there's a superposition in my brain of like 
Morrissey or Robert Smith and and Jeff Tweedy and Jazz Coleman and Noel Gallagher and like you know all these fucking British guys. Well, except for Jeff Tweedy, yeah. you know, and like <laughs> it's just they're all they're all there and all their voices are sort of like flitting around my brain. And then at some point, like I land on the one the vibe that feels right, and it's just like oh, that's the direction to go in. Um, uh, yeah, I, I I like that. I like. Uh, I, I like that 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 analogy. Yeah, because <laughs> it does feel like that's that's a thing. I remember watching an interview with with Daniel Higgs, and he was talking about you know writing music and it, it just being this energy in the universe that he's pulling from. And it sounds like this really hippy dippy shit, but like at some level, like I kind of buy that because I don't necessarily think it's like in the fabric of the cosmos, but I do think that like just by having been a fan of music my whole life and having been a fan of so many genres for basically my whole life that there is just this kind of like swarm of like information in my head that it's just a matter of like tapping into you know like you like i listen to this band for long enough you start to have like an intuition for their songs and how they're structured and you listen to this genre for so long and you, you have an intuition about what it should sound like and what it should feel like. And then when you're writing your own material, it's not necessarily pulling up one of those songs and being like, yeah, cool. This riff mine now it's like, no, like what, what is the feeling that I get from listening to this riff? And now can I redirect that feeling into my own hands and like come out with something on the other end that's it in, indirectly referencing it, but is itself a new thing. Um, yeah. So I don't know. It just feels like, yeah, there, there is just this like bubbling, uh, uh, quantum field of, <laughs> <laughs> of post-punk and death metal and pop and whatever floating around there. And then it just sort of, you know, it has to, you know, you just need to kind of open yourself to that. And then, yeah, man, just try to kind of like, uh, measure the, the photon just right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, the, and then you, the, the dual slit experiment. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's sort of that, uh, that, that philosophical question that gets asked of whether or not mathematics is invented or discovered, mm. right? Like are people discovering fundamental aspects of how the universe works or are humans kind of inventing these symbols, um, as a way to kind of make sense of the world. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm certainly more on the, uh, discovered end of that spectrum, right? I think that, mm. I think that we're discovering fundamental aspects of what's going on, uh, through mathematical reasoning. And mm. I think that there's, there's some similarities to music in that, uh, you know, my, my experience is that a lot of good songs are kind of discovered in the sense that like, like you're saying, where there's this sort of stew of possibility and then it suddenly coalesces into something that makes sense. Yeah. And you've just sort of like flipped it around in your head enough that you suddenly discover a new pattern that actually makes sense with the the human brain to be a good musical idea, right? It almost feels like um, uh, I play this this word game in the in the New York Times where it's a uh, um, like a honeycomb of different letters and mm. you have to to find the words in them, right? Mm. And you kind of look at it and it's just a, a jumble of letters and you sort of see different parts of it and you're like, okay, well, there's an O, a U, and a G H, so you know there's it's probably like through. Or some or tough or something. Yeah, like yeah. That. And then all of a sudden, you know, the letters just immediately turn into a word, and you can't unsee it. It's like, oh, there's the word. Yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah, right. And I, and I think that that creating music, while not a perfect analogy, sort of feels like that, where you have these these different sections that kind of make sense, and then you sort of discover a way to put them together that actually resonates as a musical idea in a human brain. Yeah, I. That's that is really. Honestly, I think what it what it feels like. Um, yeah, and then I think you know I'm I'm just depending on my mood. I'm I'm more or less open to that. You know, I think it also it is just sort of being like I have all this other stuff going on, or I'm stressed about this, and just you know sometimes it just takes like hearing a new 
record or a song and suddenly the 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 taps back on and it's it is easier to to make sense of that or or i'm at least inspired to you know i'm not i i never i don't think i've ever sat down and just said i'm going to write a song it's like i feel like writing a song or oh I, i'm humming this thing and i sit down and start doing it i mean i might play idly and something might come of it but i'm not i'm there's never like a okay time to write like i just can't do it um because I don't know that 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 whatever the the roiling uh, the roiling cosmos of, uh, <laughs> of tunes in my head uh, it won't let me access it if I want to can only can only be observed indirectly. Uh, um, <laughs> I really like. I honestly, I think about. I sometimes I, I I think about this shit a lot, and I've never I've never taken it to quite this degree. But I really I really like it. I, I do feel like it is. It's a good analogy. Can, you can only use a mirror to look at a basilisk. You can't look directly <laughs> at it. <laughs> oh man, yeah, yeah, that's good shit. I like that a lot. Um, <laughs> Well, there we go. So, so we, we can hopefully intellectualize songwriting to the point that, uh, um, maybe we just can't do it anymore. Uh, yeah. I mean like, dude, that's why, yeah, man, like it's, it's, uh, I'm trying to think of like, um, yeah, we're, 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 we're just going to evolve beyond that and it's going to be, I don't know. Like I, I was, I was, I was thinking about like, um, Again, listen to that that interview you did with um with Preston Preston right, yeah, and about talking about noise music and and I was like and to me it was like, you know, part of the appeal of noise music is is just the reduction of music to like pure texture, and like, yeah, there can be a, a narrative there that can be a, a, a there could be movements within noise or or ambient you know more so ambient is maybe easier because ambient can be I think a bit more tonal than noise, but, but still it's like noise in particular or harsh noise. It's just like you've reduced the act of listening to just for me, at least just listening to texture, you know, I mean, there, there is movement in it and there maybe is, there are changes and dynamics, but you know, listening to this static or this sort of like roiling noise, like it, it's, it's the most fundamental uh, you know, it's reducing music to its most fundamental state or 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 sound, and listening to it in that level. And, and I don't know, maybe maybe that's that's where we're headed. That's where, you know, that's that's what's going to eventually just be coming out of of all of us is just like all the music is. There's no more music. Where where it's now just. Now we're we're only listening to those. What's the sound of the cosmos things? Where it's like those sped up. Um, like radio waves coming from like planets, yeah, sure. and it's and it's just okay. There we are. There's the, there's the new hit single. It's Pluto. It's the the heat, <laughs> it's the heat death of music. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh my god. So Andy, if if people want to hire you or even have you write a bunch of songs for them, I mean, it sounds like that would be something that would go well for you. You should you should. They gotta write, write the lyrics though. People. Okay, I, yeah. I, I can maybe come up with a few lines, but you're on your own from there. Yeah. What, <laughs> uh, what 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 should they do? What records should they check out to hear your audio expertise? Um, well, um, I, I still call Sourmouth a current band of mine, even though we haven't released anything in like I don't know. I think it's been three years now. But Sourmouth, we're on Spotify. Like Rats, that uh, is it's a nice death metal band that you and I playing together. Um, uh, that's out there. Uh, on Spotify. Um, I used to play in a band called Weekend Nachos. That's out there if you Google it. Uh, I've played in a band called Belonger. B-E-L-O-N-G-E-R. That's on Bandcamp. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that's, yeah, you're asking about like music stuff you can find, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. And, well, and what about, what about, I mean, pr production stuff yeah, too and then, for Bricktop? Of course. Like, what are some records uh, you're proud of? So uh, uh, records I'm proud of, uh, actually, if you go to bricktoprecording.com, um, there is a playlist, um, a Spotify playlist of of stuff that I've I've done I've done that's on Spotify that I'm particularly proud of. Um, 
I'm really proud of the Never Ending Game record that came out, um, I think, two years ago. There's this band called 156 Silence, who put out an LP, uh, I think, last year. That, I think, is awesome, and I'm really proud of. Um, this band from Columbus called Bather. Um, there's another band from Chicago called Karma, and I did their EP that came out um, this year. I think I think all this came out this year. It's It's hard to say, because it's always like it takes like half a year to a year for it to actually come out. Um, uh, the, uh, the last lurk EP, uh, electroshock. I think that thing's awesome. Um, yeah, man, there's, it's all, if you go to bricktoprecording.com, um, there's a Spotify playlist and my, yeah. my handle everywhere is Andy Haybro, um, Instagram, Twitter, all that jazz. Twitter is not really very related to anything professional except for me retweeting stuff. Um, other than that, it's a lot of like, I don't know, dick jokes or something. <laughs> foul um, mouth, foul mouth humor. Yeah. And, uh, oh, and if you want, if you are interested, send me an email in working with me in any capacity, send me an email at Andy at bricktop com. Don't DM me on Instagram. Don't DM <laughs> me on Facebook. Definitely don't DM me on Twitter. I hate DMs. Please email me. <laughs> no, if you contact me there, I'll respond. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll put all the all those records you mentioned in the show notes too so people can click through and listen to some of that stuff. Cool. Right on. Which I recommend. Great, man. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, the best thing to do would be to send it to one of your friends who also likes podcasts. If you want more, I have an email list where I send out a weekly update with all the podcasts I've recorded and articles that I've written. I also include my favorite things that I've been reading or listening to as well. You can sign up for that at www.toddneve.com. That's I before E. Or you can open up the show notes in your podcast player and click the link in there.